So we're going to start a, a series called The Bible, Homosexuality, and Gender. So we're going to talk about these things that are going on in the culture. And uh, we're going to have six total sessions. In those sessions, we're going to walk through the Bible's teaching on homosexuality and gender. We're going to look at what God says from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end about these things. We're going to look at the objections that people have, that if you Googled what does the Bible say about homosexuality, what does the Bible say about gender, you're going to get all kinds of things that say, well, the Bible doesn't mean this or the Bible doesn't mean that. So we want to be able to answer those. And then we want to talk about the larger issue of the consequences. What, what are the consequences to the individuals who get pulled into this, these, these things? And what is the consequence to the culture, to the groups, and to the nation at large that give in to these things and approve of them? What are the consequences of those? So that's what we want to do. And there will be six sessions, as I said. The first, which we'll begin today, is the Bible and homosexuality. We want to look at the Bible from the very beginning to the very end and how it talks about the issue of homosexual relationships, homosexual marriage, and all of that. In our second session, we want to talk about the, what we call the born gay and the love objections. These are the two most common objections in the, the culture today to the Bible's position, which I'm sure you, you know is that it's not, it's not right, these are the, that you're born gay, God made you that way, therefore God does, approves of it. And then if we love each other, if it's a loving, committed relationship, then it's okay for us to have this kind of relationship. We're going to answer those, and we're going to spend a whole session on that. Thirdly, we'll look at the Bible and transgenders. We'll go back and we'll just look at the Bible. What does it say about men, born male, wanting to be females, or vice versa? What does the Bible say about that, and how do we address it? And then fourthly, we want to look at these two things, homosexuality and transgenderism, as they affect the individual. Because what we hear in the culture is it doesn't, it doesn't, it's, not, it's a victimless crime that, that if you do this, it's okay. It's, it's something you want to do. It's not anything that affects anyone else, and it doesn't, certainly doesn't hurt you. So we want to look at that. What are the ramifications of choosing these ways of living? And then fifthly, we want to talk about the consequences, not to the individual, but to groups and nations who completely give in to these kinds of things. What, is God said, is say, what does God say is going to happen at, to those groups and nations as a result of doing these things? And then finally, we want to talk about sort of a strategy session as believers, I think you recognize, if you're paying attention, that on these, these types of, 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 of ideas, there is an organized effort in the culture to push them forward. There's a book written in the early 2000s called The Homosexual Agenda that lays out and we are seeing how this is played out. So I want to help you see what the agenda is. I want to help you see what the strategy is. And then how do we as believers respond to that? All right? So that's, those will be the six sessions. And the first will be the Bible and homosexuality. We want to frame this discussion of the Bible and homosexuality using an objection that's often put forward about, the, about this issue. And that is that Jesus didn't condemn it. That Jesus didn't have anything to say about it. Uh, one of the most famous people that has spoken about this view and pushed this view in the culture is actually Jimmy Carter. Those of you who are a little bit older, you know who Jimmy Carter is, the former president in the 70s from Georgia, who has made it very well known that he's a Christian. But Jimmy Carter held a, a very uh, unbiblical view about homosexuality, and here's what he, he is what he said. He said, homosexuality was well known in the ancient world, well before Christ was born, and Jesus never said a word about homosexuality. And this is a common strategy. If you've got something that you want to, to get approved in the culture and you don't want anybody saying it's wrong, especially the Christian, then what you do is you say, well, Jesus didn't talk about that. Therefore, it's okay. And a lot of people inside the church and outside of the church use this argument to say, well, Jesus didn't say anything about it. Therefore, it's okay. 
That's how we want to frame this. At the end of talking about the Bible and homosexuality, we want to come back and see what did Jesus say about it and how does that relate to the whole Bible uh, that, we're going to, that we're going to review, that all the things that the Bible says. So let's keep that in mind as we go through this. But there is so much to cover in the Bible that we're going to have to split this first session into two parts because there's a lot to get into. And as I said, I want to deal with objections too. I don't want to state this is what the Bible says. That's very important. But then I want to say, hey, this is what other people are saying and this is why it's not true. So we're going to do this in two parts. Part one, we'll talk about homosexuality in the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament say about it? And then in the second part, we'll talk about the New Testament. That's where we'll get into uh, some of the things that Jesus said as well. So let's get started then with the Old Testament and homosexuality. Let's go back to the beginning and let's start there. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, back to the beginning when God created men and women. Now, we're all very familiar with the Bible's teachings on this, right? We're all very familiar as Christians of what the Bible teaches about uh, God creating the man and the woman. So we don't want to go into a whole lot of detail here. I just want to see what this says and apply it to homosexuality. So let's look at a couple of verses, and then let's begin our discussion of the Bible and homosexuality. Genesis 2, 7 through 8, and 21 through 22. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Right? So we all know this. Let's go on and hit some verses right at the end. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. So again, our purpose is not to go into great detail on marriage here. Our purpose is to look at this from a design standpoint. From when God designed the man and the woman, and he talked about sex, and he talked about marriage, what did he lay out as that design? Okay? This also has applications to gender, but we're not going to look at gender specifically here, but we're going to look at it later. So let's look at what God shows us here. Now, let me let you know something. This is for, our, for all of our young people and all of our older people too, and even me at 25. We, we, <laughs> I got a couple of laughs on that. When God does something, He instructs us by what He does and by what he does not do. Does that make sense? So that's why we look in the New Testament and we see what Jesus did. Jesus did this to the leper. Jesus did this to the woman at the well. We look because God is perfect. Everything he does teaches us something, not just what he says. So when we look in the Garden of Eden, we see God telling us about how he designed things just by what he does. So let's look here and let's see what God is telling us about His design from the Garden of Eden. Okay, first of all, let's notice God creates a single man and a single woman. Do you see that? Not single is not married, but one man, a single one man and a single one woman. Okay? He does not create a man and two women and say, Adam, uh, you know, take, your, take your choice. He doesn't create uh, a woman and two men. And he doesn't say, Adam, you can have a man if you want, or uh, you can have, Eve, you could have another woman if you see that. He created one man, and he created one woman. He is teaching us, this is my design. He only makes one of each. And then he commands them to become intimate. But what God told them was, do you remember the, the, the language? Be fruitful and multiply. Now, what is God authorizing there? He's authorizing intimacy. He's authorizing them to be able to have sex. That's implied in what God does there. He, he, he creates a man and a woman. He marries them, brings them together, and then he says, be fruitful. So he is authorizing intimacy right there, saying, it's good. It's okay. Right? But he allows no options, does he? He creates no alternatives. He gives no choices. Adam, 
This is Eve. She's, you're a man. She's a woman. You are to come together. You are to get married. You are to procreate. That's my design. And then in doing so, he reveals the standard for sex, marriage, and gender. Do you see that? Just by what he did, the infinite mind laid it out. This, so everything else outside of that then is outside of the design and is wrong. The Creator, get, He made us, He made the world. He gets to set the rules. It's His creation. Okay? Now let's make an important point here, one that will help us deal with some objections later on. To God, marriage and sex are so interrelated, so connected, that they can't be separated. Marriage, which implies love and commitment, is expected to include intimacy or sex. Therefore, separating sex and a loving, committed marriage relationship is evil. And we see that in our culture. We, people talk about hooking up, going to bars and sleeping together. But there's no love, there's no commitment, there's no marriage. You see that? That is wrong. To separate these two things, love and commitment in marriage and sex, is evil. And it is a strategy of the world and the wicked one. If we can split these things up, then we can start to send people down the wrong path. To put it another way, when you talk about how God views sex... He is always assuming marriage and the existence of a loving, committed relationship. He's always assuming that when you, when you talk about sex. Okay? Now, that's Genesis. We look and we see God just establishing the design based on what He did. Now, let's look through the Old Testament and let's see if this keeps showing up the same. One of the things that people say about the Bible is they say the Bible's full of contradictions and errors. They'll say the Bible says this in one place and that in another place and this in one place and that in another place. But if you give the Bible a chance, if you just throw out that and say, hold on a minute, let me see, let me look at this with an open mind, you'll see the Bible is as tight, uh, it's as tight as it can be. So let's look at this. Let's go now to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19. Now, I'm not going to read the whole account because it's rather lengthy. And we've all heard about it, but let's look at some detail at this. Genesis 19. <clears throat> now, before they lay down, okay, so this is Lot. Lot and two, two angels come to see Sodom. And they come to visit Lot, who is Abraham's nephew. And the Bible describes Lot as a righteous man in that city. And Lot sees them and invites them into his house. This is what happens. Now before they lay down, before they go to bed that night, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. This is a little bit of a crazy situation, isn't it? A little bit later on, now we're not going to go through all the details right now. Then the men, these are the angels, said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So these two angels come in the form of men. Remember we talked about that before Christmas, that angels can present themselves as men, and you can't tell the difference. They present themselves as men, and they enter Lot's house. Lot meets him at the gate, and he sees him coming in, and Lot knows the city, and he knows it's getting late, it's getting dark. So Lot says, no, come come, stay with me. And the men say, no, we're not going to stay with you. We've got other business. And Lot says, no, 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 you've got to come with me. Come with me now. Because bad things are about to happen to you. So they come to Lot's house, and these men show up from old and young, from all over the city, from every quarter. 
And they start beating on the door. Bring these men out. We want them. And they specifically say what they want to do with them. And Lot's fighting them. No, no, no. Don't do this. Don't do this. He eventually even offers his daughters. He says, look, you can't do this to these men. I'll give you my daughters. Just don't do it to these men. They say, no, we don't want them. We want the men. Eventually, they, force, they try to force their way through the door. The angels touch them and they become blind and eventually they dissipate and the angels are spared this, this attack. What does this tell us? This demonstrates the degree to which this perversity had consumed these cities. The Bible talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. Two cities. We're going to look at a map in a minute. I'm going to show you where these are. And it consumed them. It had taken over them. It was all they thought about. All they, it, was, it was the sin that characterized the whole area. Does that start to sound like somewhere else you know? Can you get out of homosexuality on TV anymore? Every ad, every show, every news report, every single time they can, they are old and young from every quarter, bringing it to your door and saying, you're going to take this. You're going to love this. And in fact, we're going to take your children. We're going to try and make them into this. Hmm. Yeah, that old book, it just doesn't matter today, does it? It had consumed them. And it shows God's justification. Why God was right to do what He did. Which was to destroy them with fire and brimstone. He rained down hell on these cities the very next day. What do you think that means about how God views this? Do you think that's God approving? This is not God approving. God hates this sin. He loves people. But he hates the sin. And he will destroy any nation or group that allows themselves to be taken over by it. But some people don't like this. They don't agree with this teaching. They don't like that what the Bible says here, so they come up with an objection. But there's a guy named Matthew Vines. And Matthew Vines wrote a book called God and the Gay Christian. And in that book, he objects to this teaching here about regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. And what he tries to do is change its teaching, change what it's saying from homosexual, homosexual sin to something else. So let's look and see what he says here. He says, it's commonly assumed that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah out of His wrath against same-sex relations. But the only form of same-sex behavior described in the story is an attempted gang rape. Nothing like a loving, committed relationship. The Bible explicitly condemns Sodom for its arrogance, inhospitality, and apathy toward the poor, not for same-sex behavior. So we have this account that we just read in Genesis Sodom and Gomorrah, we see what the center of this is, but this fellow's coming along and other people are saying, no, that's not what it was talking about. Well, what he's doing here, he's really giving you three different objections. First of all, he's saying that the sin was not homosexuality. See here in this, this bottom part, the Bible explicitly condemns Sodom for its arrogance, inhospitality, and apathy toward the poor, not for same-sex behavior. That's what he says the sins are. Odd how you could get that out of those words. but And then secondly, he says that what was condemned here was gang rape and not homosexuality. And then thirdly, he says that loving, committed homosexual relationships are different from what is going on in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. You see that? Those are really the three things. Now, we're not going to deal with the third one yet because we're going to deal with that one in a, in a later session. That's the love objection. We love each other, therefore it's different than what the Bible's talking about. Right? We're going to deal with the, with the first two, and we're kind of going to do those one after the other in, in, the, in sort of the same uh, uh, 
step. So let's do that. Let's look at those objections and see what they say. Where does this come from here? This, this statement the, where he says that the Bible explicitly condemns Sodom for its arrogance, inhospitality, and apathy toward the poor. Where does he get that? You know, that's the first time that I had heard that. So I actually went through and just Googled and looked up all the verses that deal with homosexuality, and I found it. There is a verse in here that talks about Sodom and these kinds of sins. And it's from Ezekiel. So let's look at Ezekiel 49 and let's deal with this issue. Is, is, is Matthew Vines correct? In Ezekiel 16, 49, the prophet says this. And this, these are God's words from Ezekiel to Judah. He says, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. See that? All right, so we have here him mentioning Sodom. And when he mentions Sodom and her daughter, Sodom and her daughter, he talks about some of their sins that stem from pride. She had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. What this means is Sodom and Gomorrah were very wealthy. They were very well-to-do. So that wealth and that success caused them to be proud. And the word idleness here means they were free from war. That, that everything was at peace in their land. Other people were having wars, but there was peace here in Sodom. And so the wealth and the peace and the arrogance caused these people to become more and more sinful. Does that sound like America? They're fighting a war <clears throat> in Ukraine. Well, we're safe here. We're rich and we're prosperous and we got SEAL Team 6. Nobody can touch us right now. And this arrogance and this pride and all this money and all this time and all these resources caused them to sin. They sought after their own pleasure instead of seeking after the needs of other people like the poor. So that's what Ezekiel, that's what's being said here. But what is the larger context of this? Why is God even mentioning Sodom here? Why would God go to Judah and say, your sister Sodom? Why does he refer to, refer to Sodom's daughter? Let's go on and let's look at the verses. Let's look at the verses that precede this. Let's go back a couple. The Lord says to Judah, Your elder sister is Samaria, who dwells with her daughters to the north of you. And your younger sister, who dwells to the south of you, is Sodom and her daughters. You did not walk in their ways nor act according to their abominations. But as if that were too little, you became more corrupt than they in all your ways. So you see here, he's saying your older sister Judah is Samaria, and your younger sister is Sodom. What is God saying? Why is he using this language? Well, let's look at a map. Okay, let's look at the map. All right. You remember that Israel was originally set up as 12 tribes. You remember that? There was Manasseh and Levi and Judah and Benjamin and all these, Asher and Dan. You remember that? So those are just 12 groups, 12 families, and they were each given a part of the land in Israel. But after the death of Solomon, the kingdom split in two. And you had two kingdoms arise. You had the northern kingdom, which was known as Samaria, and then you had the southern kingdom, which was known as Judah. So let's look here as we look at this. All right, so up here, that's the northern kingdom. Do you see that? That's what broke off after the death of Solomon, became the north. And then down here at the bottom, you have the southern kingdom. You see that? All right. So when God is using this language, what he is doing, there is Jerusalem. Remember, that's the capital of the, both, both the north and south in, in the beginning. And then we have up here, we have Samaria, which is the capital of the north. And then we have Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah are down in the bottom on the other, way down to the south. Now let's focus in on this part of the map here as we try and understand why God is using the term Sodom and her sisters here in this verse. Let's look at this. All right. What you can see here, God says, Samaria to the north is your sister. And Sodom and Gomorrah to the south are your other sisters? 
What is God saying? God is saying, Judah, you have been righteous longer than these other groups, but you are so wicked now that you are like your sister to the north, Samaria. In fact, you're so wicked, you're just like your sister to the south, Sodom. What is God saying? He's saying, you have become more polluted than everybody else. And that is why God is mentioning Sodom here. But does this mean that Sodom was not guilty of homosexuality? And I'm going to make a point to you here that's going to help you be, better, be a better discerner of truth in this rotten culture that you live in. What happens is, this guy, when he quotes the verse, he doesn't quote the rest of it. Let's see what the rest of the verse says. He quoted 49 here. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. But let's read on. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. He says, Sodom committed an abomination. What is the abomination? Let's look at Leviticus 18.22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. See, right there it is. But this guy doesn't quote it because he doesn't want to quote it. And then God says, therefore I took them away as I saw fit. Which, what does that mean? I destroyed them with fire and brimstone. The sin of pride had caused Sodom to seek after pleasure, after pleasure, after pleasure. And then eventually that led them into the abomination of homosexuality and it consumed them and God destroyed them for it. That's what this verse teaches. No matter what this guy says, this is the sin. Now let's go to the New Testament. What does Jude say about this? Let's look over and see if this is confirmed. In Jude 1.7, the apostle writes, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities that around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual, sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So when you get over to the New Testament, remember this guy saying, gang rape is what's going on here. This isn't homosexuality. But when we get over to the New Testament, he says that they were given over. Sodom was given over to, sec <clears throat> to sexual immorality. Of uh, what kind of sexual immorality? Does anybody remember another apostle talking about a nation being given over to a sin? Good Bible students, where, where does the apostle Paul talk about God giving people over to sexual sins? Romans 1. Romans 1, 24 through 28. Now I want you to ask yourself as we read through giving, being given over to sexual sin, what kind of sin was it? It says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, Romans 1, in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. What is that, guys? That's homosexuality. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. What kind of sin were they given over to, according to Romans 1? Homosexuality. Homosexuality being pervasive in a culture, being everywhere, being inundating the culture is a sign that God is turning the whole culture loose so that He can destroy it. There's just no way around it. And you're living in that culture. Don't you take pride for one minute in the might of your military. Don't you think for one minute God can't bring this nation down. I've talked to you about debt. I've talked to you about all the different ways that God could bring us down. You're living in that nation. 
He said they had given themselves over to it. Given themselves over. And then he says they had gone after strange flesh. Strange flesh. That's an odd way to say something, isn't it? Now look, if we're talking about gang rape, that's an awfully weird way to say that, isn't it? You would think in Greek, one of the most powerful languages that there ever has been, you could find a way to say gang rape. He said strange flesh. Do you know what that means? That means the other flesh. That means these men didn't want the woman that God had prepared for them. They wanted the other flesh. They wanted men. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah, the sin of Sodom, certainly pride, certainly arrogance, all of that. But the thing that tipped the scales was this giving over to this homosexual sin. And here's a point for you that we're going to learn from this. It's not really related to homosexuality. It's related to being discerning in this culture. Always check the source yourself. Young people, when somebody in, the church, in school says, Jesus said this, you go in the Bible and you find where Jesus said that and you read it yourself. You see what we did? We went to Ezekiel and we read it ourselves and we see that this guy is lying. He is manipulating. He is trying to get us to believe something that is not true. If someone says the Constitution of the United States says such and such, what should you do? Find the Constitution and read it. If somebody says the Bible says this or the Bible says that, what should you do? Read it yourself. Or you're just going to be strung along like the Pied Piper. And so many of us are today. Now let's look at the law. We'll be brief here. Let's go to the law now. So we looked at Sodom and Gomorrah. We looked at Genesis, creation. We looked at Sodom and Gomorrah. Now let's just look at the law. Leviticus 20.13. It says, if a, man, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So we saw it in the garden, God's design. We saw Sodom and Gomorrah, God responding to that design and fighting for that design. And then we see in the law, God saying, you're not to do this. An abomination means a hated thing. God, does not, God hates this sin. He does not like this at all. All right? But God here is not focusing just on homosexuality. He's not just picking it out of the blue and going, hey, let me, put, let me pick on these particular people. Leviticus 20, and in fact Leviticus 18, which I quoted to you earlier, is God going through a whole section of the law where He's saying, when it comes to intimacy and sex, you're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do this. And so here we have God forbidding adultery in the same chapter. God forbidding having relations with your in-laws. Homosexuality in verse 13. He's saying you can't marry a woman and her mother. Okay, You're not supposed to have relationships with a woman and her mother. Animals, siblings, brothers and sisters, um, uncles and aunts, wives. God just goes through and He just says all of these different things. And what is He doing? He's saying everything outside of one man and one woman, married, in a relationship, loving, committed relationship, everything else is wrong. But God gives them examples just so you don't go, well, God, well, Jesus never said. So God says, okay, well, let me give you all these examples. All right? Barack Obama, back during his presidency, and I think when he was running for office, the question of homosexual marriage came up. And he brought up an objection that comes up an awful lot about these kinds of passages in the law. He talked about God forbidding the Israelites from eating shellfish. He said, the, the Bible says eating shellfish is an abomination. So what... what Who's going to take that for serious? So how are we going to take the homosexual commandment seriously if, if we're not going to take the rest of it seriously? And there is a verse on that. Did you know that? Where God tells the Israelites they're not supposed to eat shellfish. Leviticus 11. The Lord says, You may eat whatever in the water has fins and scales, but all, all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh. Now what is going on here? Has the Lord just gone off the rails? Is He just being, He just doesn't want you to, who likes shrimp in here? Everybody. Who likes lobster in here? Okay, I don't like any of them. 
I don't like any seafood. I'm the only one who obeys this. <laughs> Why would God say this? Why would God say this? Did you know that sea creatures that walk along the bottom of the, in the mud, that they have more parasites and more bacteria than those that swim along? And did you know that if you don't properly clean and prepare and sanitize the stuff you get off the bottom of the sea, it can make you extremely sick? Did you know that? God was protecting them. Laird Harris, in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, he said this about the whole shrimp thing. He said, fish that have fins and scales are free swimming and in general are free from parasites. Scaleless fish are more likely carriers of parasites since they are scavengers and mud bottom dwellers. So what God is doing here is He's taking this nomadic people. Remember, this is a group of slaves that have come out of Egypt. They don't know what to eat from what not to eat. They don't know cleanliness. They don't. Did you know, that in fact, that circumcision has, has great health benefits because non-circumcised men can cause women to get cervical cancer. And God says, all my people are going to be circumcised. God had promised, when you come out of the land, if you obey me, you won't get sick like the other nations. I will protect you. Exodus 15, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, give ear to His commandments and keep them, I will put none of the diseases on you on which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. God, when He says, look, you don't know anything about how to prepare this stuff, so don't eat the stuff that crawls along the bottom. He is protecting them from sickness and disease. He is saying, you're going to get sick if you eat these, so don't eat this. In the same way, when He says, you're not to be intimate, a man and a man. You're not to be intimate, a man and a woman. You're not to sleep with your uh, brother's wife. You're not to to have in relations with animals. He's saying, I'm going to protect you from sickness and perversity and things that will destroy you. Do you see? It's exactly the same. Don't eat the, the fish that walk along, the, the creatures that walk along the bottom of the ocean, and don't sleep around. Now, are there any diseases that come out of homosexual relationships? And guess what? If a man marries a woman, does not have intercourse outside of that, they will probably never, ever get those diseases. Hmm. I wonder if there's something to this thing after all. He goes on, and I'm, I'm not going, for time's sake, I'm going to skip this part, but he goes on and he, he uh, Matthew Vines makes the case that Leviticus doesn't apply to us. And I've got a little couple of slides to talk about that there are things from the law that come forward when we see the moral nature of God and when we see it affirmed in the New Testament, it still applies. Okay? So that Leviticus commandment about homosexuality still applies because when we go over to the New Testament, we see the Bible saying, yes, don't do this. You see that? It is affirmed in the New Testament. And what we're going to do next time is we're going to look at the New Testament and see what it says. Does it indeed confirm that we're not supposed to have homosexual relations? And then what does Jesus Himself say about it? But I want to make one, draw one final principle, again, that's outside of the actual teaching. Do you notice how I have tried to answer the objections as I go along? In our culture today, parents... Te Bible teachers, preachers, we cannot simply state what the Bible says. We must also answer the objections that the world is going to throw at our people as soon as they walk out the door. Because let's think about this for a minute. I quoted Leviticus 20, 13. It says, if a man lies with a, a man as he lies with a woman, it's an abomination. Now, in our culture today, what do you think the kids are going to do as soon as they leave here? What do you think people who don't believe this, maybe they're watching on Facebook or they watch the YouTube video, what are they going to do when they hear me say that? Oh, well, Matthew Vine says the law doesn't apply to us. Oh, well, this guy says shellfish are bad, and obviously the Bible's full of baloney. Ah, 
what are they going to do? And what are they going to do? They're going to hear what you said, and they're going to walk right out the door, and they're going to hear every reason not to believe it, and you didn't address it, so they're going to believe what they heard out in the world. You have to give the people answers to the objections that they're going to hear. If you don't, you will be able to state God's truth. And there is great value in that. And the Holy Spirit absolutely can use that. But the Holy Spirit also commands us, don't just stand there and take it when somebody says, my word isn't true. Go and dig it out and give them an answer. Paul said, we cast down arguments. That's reasonings, ways of thinking, objections. We cast them down. He said, we're going to destroy them. Every argument, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If somebody comes along and says, God doesn't exist, the Christian is supposed to say, yes, He does, and this is why. Somebody says, homosexuality is not wrong. Jesus didn't say anything about it. We're supposed to have an answer for that. But if you don't give the answer when you're teaching it, you're leaving the door open for Satan to come in and steal the truth right out of their mind. In our culture, we have to make that extra effort. We have to go to that extra mile to make sure that we're defending. And that's what I was trying to do here. Did you see that? And after you hear the answers, what do you think? <laughs> the Bible's right. There's no way around it. So we have to do that. And so the next time we'll look at homosexuality in the New Testament. And we're going to go through and look at the, what the apostles say. We're going to look at the words of Christ. And we're going to tie everything that we've talked about from Genesis all the way back to what Jesus said.